but the truth will help me God. In fact, I think that's an appropriate song that leads right in to the message today as we're talking about worry, but don't worry about it. Uh, you know, last week we did the communion together, and it's always a great celebration when we partake of communion together and fellowship together on that level. But the week before that, I spoke out of Matthew on anger, and I know nobody needed that sermon. A bunch of liars. We'll talk about that next week. <laughs> But I thought a great, <coughs> great segue into that, <coughs> excuse me, was what the Lord had to say in regard to the Sermon on the Mount regarding these attitudes and our faith system. Obviously, that understanding in the context of our anger that God's still in control. And us getting upset about something isn't necessarily going to change anything. Amen? But I thought this was an appropriate message today. In fact, it's going to take me two sermons at least to get, get into this and on the level that I want to get into it. Because so many people are so, uh, I think, r really, uh, for lack of a better term, they're restricted in what God would have them do and what they could see God do in their life because they're too busy trying to manage everything themselves. And it really confines what God wants to do. You know, in, in Psalm 78, it says, The children of Israel limited the Holy One. They limited God. You say, Well, how can God be limited? Well, He's unlimited. But if you want to move in your life in an unlimited manner, then you're going to have to be the one who drops the limitations and removes the restrictions and the boundaries. And some of the things that hinder God, obviously, is what we talked about a couple weeks ago with anger, but also this area of worry. It is so easy in this culture that we live in to get so wrapped up in this. And Jesus knows this, even in the present culture that he was in, that men always lean to stress and anxiety and fear and worry much quicker than we do to the, to the realm of trusting God and living a life of faith and really believing God in our everyday walk in life. So I think this is certainly an appropriate message. We're going to read from uh, the book of Matthew, as I said, the Sermon on the Mount, um, in Matthew chapter 6, so you can open your Bibles there if you'd like, or we will have it on the wall as well. But in getting to Matthew chapter 6, I'll ask you to do what we do each Sunday. Let's stand together in the honor of reading of God's Word today. In verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for he will hate one, and he'll love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. For this reason, I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Verse 26 goes on to say, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor do they gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, by worrying, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? Or, and why, do you, why are you anxious about your clothing? Or observe how the lilies of the field grow, and they don't toil, nor do they spin. Did I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these? But if God so raised the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious in saying, what do we eat? What shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things, the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May God bless his reading of this word. You may be seated today. Boy, there's so much that just stands out in this passage. But the continuing message here over and over, in fact, you know, repeated three times in verses 25, 31, and 34 are these words, don't worry. Don't worry, but I mean, let's take an honest inventory of our own lives this morning as we look at the Word of God because it becomes pointless if we don't do that, amen? I mean, why would we sit and just be hearers only? We want to respond to what God's saying. We want to go deeper, further with Him than what we've been walking in our lives, and certainly we should pay attention to the words of the Lord Jesus when He says, stop worrying. Quit worrying. Why are you worrying? And we, and we just deal. The heart of the message is pretty simple. Don't worry, not even about the necessities of life. Now, that's one thing to hear that, but it's another thing to do that, amen? 
Don't worry. In fact, over these two messages, this Sunday and next Sunday, there's about four points I'm going to bring out, out to you, and, and they'll go like this. Point number one will be this. It is unfaithful to worry because of our master. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Secondly, we'll talk about that. It's unnecessary. No one's unfaithful because of the master. Your worrying is really unnecessary because you have a heavenly father. Now, next week, we'll talk about these next two points, which worry is unreasonable. Why is it unreasonable? Because of your faith in the Lord. And the fourth point will be simple. It's unwise to worry, as we'll talk about next week, because of your future. But first of all, let's start with that first point that I, that I made the statement about worry is unfaithful because of our master. He says there, you know, for this reason, I say, do not be anxious for your life. For this reason. Now, catch the words, and I, and I highlighted them on the screen, for this reason. What reason? Now, if you go back to the verse before that, he says, hey, you can't serve God and you can't serve mammon. You can't serve God and you can't serve treasures and riches and you can't serve God and you can't serve wealth. It's going to be one or the other. He says you'll either hate one and love the other. And if you don't hate, you say, well, I don't, you know, I love money, but I don't hate God. <laughs> he says you're, you'll either despise one and hold to the other. And I, I've mentioned this word despite before in recent sermons even where it talks about the fact that uh, we, you know, we say we love God, but every time God speaks to us, we get angry about something the Lord's leading us to do because we don't want to do it. That's when this issue of despite comes in. We get angry with God even. He said, so you have to make choices of who you're going to serve, who your master is going to be. Now, the premise of this for this reason is he goes in and he talks about not worrying. He's saying, hey, you don't have to worry because you have this heavenly father. You have the master that you're serving, not mammon. And so since he's in charge, and since he's the one you serve, then you don't have to worry. Now, let me tell you, if mammon, if money, if this world's your answer, then you've got a lot to worry about, all right? But we, we attest as believers, those of us here today who love Jesus, would say, hey, Jesus is my Lord, he's my Savior, he's the master of my life, then what am I worrying about? Just as much in the time of Christ that the masters and there were the bond slaves and there were the, there were the servants of the household, the master made sure that his servants were taken care of because one, they had to tend to him, all right? So he wanted to tend to them in regard to their shelter, their food, their clothing. And he said, listen, you have your heavenly father who says, hey, I am Lord, but I call you friend. I mean, so there's this slavery relationship. I, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ, but it's a happy slavery, all right? Because my master loves me and he cares for me and he tends to me and he meets my needs. So Jesus is saying, you shouldn't worry because, hey, you have a heavenly father. For this reason, simply gets back to the fact that God is your master. And he's a faithful Lord and he's a faithful God. And we're to be faithful servants because he is so faithful to us. As believers, our only master, if we're truly walking with Christ, the only master we have is who? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So he's just simply saying, because God is your master, according to that verse before, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be anxious. In fact, the idea is related in the context of this whole thing is, if I am not trusting my master, that's really just disobedience. It's to be unfaithful as a servant to my master not to trust him. In the Greek word, it's, it, it, the language it reads like this. Don't be anxious. Stop being anxious. And don't be anxious anymore. <laughs> you stop it and you don't continue it. So, well, okay, I'm not worried, but you pick it up tomorrow. This is the same thing. You stop it. Quit it. Don't do it now, and don't do it anymore. Because you have the, your heavenly Father. He, he uses these words, for your life. You catch this word, for your life. It's, it's an all-inclusive term, which means the whole of your life. God's concerned about all of your life. He's talking about your physical life, your mental life, your emotional life, your spiritual life. For your life is more than just these things. Life is involved in more. So he's referring to life in the fullest possible sense that God's concerned about every aspect of your life. There's not one thing that you're dealing with right now, today, this week, that you're going to have to deal with and face it. God's not concerned about it. Or that God hadn't thought about it. Or, it may take you by surprise, but you ever thought about it? God's never surprised? <laughs> You know, nothing ever just occurs to God. He's already got this thing, all right? We'll talk about that in just a moment. But the context here is that Jesus is referring to every part of your life. There's nothing in your life, internal, 
external that justifies you as a child of God becoming anxious and worrying because of the master that you have and who he is and what he's capable of doing. Worry. If you really take it down, you break it down, it's really that you come to the place of just distrusting the providence of God and the promises of God. Distrusting his word and distrusting really his sovereignty, that he is able. I mean, just think about the promises of God that he has made to each and every one of us that love him. He has promised that no matter what happens in your life, he's going to make it so that it works out to your advantage and to your good and to your betterment. That's why the Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How in the world can I give thanks for all this? It's going to work out. I don't have to lose sleep over it. I don't have to be stressed over it. I don't have to be worried about it. When this is translated from the Greek to the German language, this word worry that's used in the German language is a terminology that literally means to strangle something or to choke something. And that is certainly an accurate description of what anxiety and stress and worry will do in your life. I'm not saying you're not facing some real obstacles. We all are. If we're not facing them today, you may be facing them in the near future. Because things happen. In this world, there's going to be tribulation. This is a fallen world. Everybody always wants to blame God for the calamities. But hey, the God of this world is Satan, and this world is plagued by sin. And God is rectifying the problem sooner than you realize when all creation will bow down before him. But here we get to this worry, this worrisome attributes of in our life, and now we're mentally tormented, we're physically afflicted, all coming out of worry. They tell us that, and I use this in my e-blast, if you're getting the e-blast, I talked about the introduction to this sermon and how that one of the great illustrations of how worry is such a detriment and damaging in our life and that causes such conflicts it, it, the illustration was used of a, of a dense fog covering city blocks that are 100 feet deep. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in those fogs that are just so thick you can't drive. I have been in those kind of fogs. That kind of fog is just crippling. They say to create that kind of fog over seven city blocks 100 feet deep only takes about a half a glass of water. To create that kind of fog, it's obviously distributed into droplets, about 60,000 million droplets, but the idea is it doesn't take a lot of worry to cripple your life and to hinder the progress of your life and to literally create bondage in your life because you get, become stressed to the, problem, to, to the point that it's difficult to deal with. I mean, think of it. Here's this little half a glass of water creating such calamity in a, in a, in a, in a closed environment like that. But it's true in our life. Worry usually is just a small portion of what reality really dictates and what reality is really stating. But we enter this little realm of fear and wrapping our, trying to wrap our minds and solve all the problems. It was once said that worry is a, is a thin stream of fear that trickles through the mind, which, if encouraged, will cut a channel so wide that all your other thoughts will be drained out. Boy, isn't that true? Everything else is just set to the side. We can't do anything but focus on the one thing, whatever that thing might be, and we're worried about it. No worry really comes down to this. It is the opposite of what God desires for our life, which is contentment. God desires us to be contentment. Remember in Philippians 4 when the, the apostle says, hey, I've learned to be content in whatever our circumstances I'm in, whether I'm abased or abounding, whether I'm in poverty or whether I'm in abundance, you know, no matter what the situation is, he said the secret is of really living your life to the fullest is learning this whole thing, what we would call contentment. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 that contentment with godliness is a great gain. But so few Christians have learned what it really means to understand and exercise contentment in their life. To say, I'm going to choose contentment over fear. I'm going to choose contentment over stress. I'm going to choose contentment over worry in my life. Amen. Contentment gets down to this place where I realize that God is God and he's made these promises to me and I'm under his ownership. I'm under his control and I'm being provided by him. So God's going to give me everything I need. I don't have to worry about these things in my life. I'm not going to be fearful anymore. I'm not going to be stressed out by these things. Contentment. Now, folks, this, the contentment is, is the difficult thing to grasp for a lot of people. I think I've broken it down from these passages into three simple areas we want to capture contentment. One is that contentment understands that God owns everything. Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything that dwells on the earth, it belongs to the Lord. 
In 1 Chronicles 29, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth. Who's it belong to? God. You're worried about how you're going to get something and meet a demand or meet a situation or have what needs to be uh, uh, required of you in a, in a certain demand on your life in, in some form or fashion. Come back to the place, hey, God owns everything. In the, on the planet, in the planet, outside the planet, the universe and the cosmos included, God created it all, God owns it all. Why am I worried? He's my heavenly Father. He's the Lord of my life. He's the master of my life. If I'm introduced to situations that are beyond my control, they're not beyond his control. If I'm introduced into situations that require more than I'm able to give, he's in charge of all those things. There's no need that you will ever face in your life now or in the future that God does not have the capacity to deal with. As I said a while ago, it just doesn't happen that all of a sudden something takes place in your life and God says, oh my, what am I going to do now for them? Look at this, oh, how'd they get to that place? And all of a sudden, God calls a board meeting and has to worry about it and worry about how he's going to handle it and worry about what he's going to do in it and worry about, hey, but we do that because we don't get back to the fact of realizing that God really is in charge of all things that the earth is really his. Some of you are familiar with John Wesley's life, the great Wesley brothers who founded the Methodist church hundreds of years ago. Someone came running up to John Wesley one day and said, Pastor Wesley, we're so sorry. And it's just frantic. Your house burned down. It caught on fire. Your house is burned down. There's nothing left. It's gone. To which John Wesley responded, not my house. It's the Lord's house. And if the Lord chose to burn it down, that's the Lord's business. That's one less thing I have to worry about. <laughs> Can we just come back to that? God owns my house. God owns my everything about my life. God owns my shirt and my shoes. God owns my car, all right? God owns, you say, well, the bank holds the market. God holds all of it. God owns the bank, all right? In case you're worried about that. There's nothing that you're going to face in your life that God did not charge of. So understand, God owns it all. That's the first key to contentment. So say it with me. God owns it all. One more time. God owns it all. You might do a little subverse that. And me included. <laughs> Second thing about contentment, you learn this, that God only owns it all, he controls it all. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God is in charge of all things. The Bible says that even this world is completely held together by his mighty word and by his power. That God controls all things. He controls everything. Thou dost rule over it all, it says in 1 Chronicles 29, 12. We read verse 11 just a while ago. He rules over it all, and it is in his hand is the power and the might. It lies in your hand, God, to make great and to strengthen everyone. Can we come back to that place, say, that whatever I'm facing, that I can't control it? How often are we always trying to kind of move something, control something, make something happen, manipulate something? I don't know about you, I'm a great planner, so I've got it all planned out, and God just wrecks my plans most of the time. I said, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> what I need to be doing is hearing God plan it out. Find out what God's doing. We get into a situation, instead of taking it to the Lord, we enter into this little worry realm, and we stress over it, and we fret over it. We start trying to figure, well, if I do this, and I don't do that, and I pay this, and I don't pay that, and I get this done, and I move this here, or I do this, and we just try to figure it all out, kind of manipulate the, the whole thing around us with our actions or our attitudes. I don't have to worry about that when I realize that God's really in charge of this situation. And instead of spending all this time worrying, I need to start seeking God's face here. And I need to get with God and hear what God is saying, what God wants to do. And if I don't get a word, don't worry about it. Keep moving forward. All right? Keep doing what God's told me to do. I'll be safe there. And then sooner or later, if I haven't gotten the word already, he's going to give me that, that word. Listen to Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, 21. I don't have those on the screen, but it says, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. What's that mean? If I don't have the wisdom, he has the wisdom. Do as James says, if any man lack wisdom, let him do what? Let him do what? You didn't answer it. Let him do what? Ask God. 
So you needing some wisdom today? Uh, Brother Joe, I've got a situation. I just don't know what to do. Ask God. Okay, I'll ask God, and I'll go try to figure it out. No, wait. <laughs> God will give you. He said, all the wisdom belongs to him. It is he who changes the seasons, the times, and the epics. It is he who removes kings and establishes kings. It is he who gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. What's he saying? God will give you what you need. That's why we seek him. And that's why he says when he talks about all this anxiety and worry, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this will be added unto you. So there's a pursuit on our path that's involved. We'll talk more about that next week. But the third element of contentment, I believe, is not only realizing God owns it all, he controls it all, but catch this, that God provides it all. He is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Philippians 4, my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The avenue, the source is heaven and God and grace and Jesus. That's, that's, the, pl- that's, the, that's the, the, the source of every, every supply for any need of our life. He's not just talking about financially, he's talking about it mentally, emotionally, spiritually. He says, he says, for all your life this consists more of this, these things. In other words, God's concerned about the whole of your life in every aspect of it. And so we want to we come to the place to learn that, hey, God owns it all, he controls it all, and he supplies it. God meets the need. My God shall supply. Jesus said, is not your life more than, bo- than your body? Isn't it more than your lifespan? Doesn't it contain more than just what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear? I mean, all these are necessary things in our life, right? Food, shelter, life, all this is part, you know? But Jesus is saying, understand, you're so worried about these things, but understand your life is really about more than just these things. And you need to understand that there's a bigger picture that's going on. But, hey, it's hard for us to get this because man has always been obsessed with the body, taking care of the body, you know, attending to the body, making sure that the body's fed and clothed and sheltered. It's a common obsession if we're not, ca- if we're not cautious. It's always about now, especially in the culture we live in, hey, man, and, and Jesus this time, most people were satisfied with one or two changes of clothes, all right? That was pretty much it for the common man, a couple things to wear. But if we were to take little tours of each of our houses this morning and open up our closets, wouldn't it be surprising to see how much clothing, how much we've emphasized in our mind, we need this and we need this and we need this. I mean, you've got to have those 42 pair of shoes to go with it. You know, the shoes got to match the belt, and the belt's got to match the pants, and the pants got to match the coat, and the coat's got to match the tie. And I just happen to have a shirt that has to be thrown in there, so I need a tie now that matches the shirt and the suit and the shoes. I've got a chance because that doesn't match that in that combination. So, we, I mean, we, we pamper it, we dress it up, we spend time looking. How, how many of you took more than a minute this morning to decide what you're going to wear? It took me 30 seconds because I figured it out last night. <laughs> Which one did I set aside? <laughs> But it's just the culture we live in. We're so obsessed with with the body and what goes on the body. We we pamper it. We decorate it. We we protect it from disease. We we seek to avoid pain with it. We build it up. We slender it down. We drape it with jewelry. We will figure out something else to keep it warm or to keep it cool. We we train it to work. We train it to play. We want it to get enough sleep. We just obsess a hundred thousand things in our life that we, we are prone to think about, worry about, and set our minds on pursuing that really aren't about life in general as a whole. We get preoccupied, in other words. When Jesus is trying to say, your bodies in and of themselves are not the source of anything. You having those clothes that look just that certain way is not really going to make you any happier. It might only tend, if you follow the thought line here, just to make you more proud. I know that one cuts a little close to home, right? (laughs) Because most of the time it really gets into... How'd I look? I look pretty good. <laughs> and I need to do some of that. Yeah. Look at that bald spot covered up pretty good. What little hair I got left, got to comb over that. You got to look all, you're so, I, I, I'm talking about me. So don't get your feelings hurt. But you should talk about you. <laughs> and see your preoccupation. And this is where the worry starts. 
This is where it all creeps in because we're, our minds are set on the wrong thing. It's our responsibility to make sure that our heart and our mind is set on things above. God's going to take care of the other things. Yeah, we want to look nice, but sometimes we've taken it well beyond just looking nice. We're so preoccupied. But this whole at thing, a attribute of worry and stress and anxiety in your life, Jesus says, stop it. Your life is more than about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear, what kind of house you're going to live in. It's a whole lot more than that. And it becomes unfaithful because we have this Father who's committed to watch out for us is the theme of what's going on here. The second point that we'll talk about today in regard to this, the worry, it's really unnecessary because of our Father. Not only is He Master, remember, He's Father. Not only Lord over all things and we serve Him, but we're His children. And we belong to him. Matthew 6, 26, the context of those verses. Will he not much more do for you, O men of little faith? Don't you think God's going to make sure you have what you need to wear? Don't you, aren't, do you not understand that God's going to make sure that you have enough to eat? Or do you not believe that God's going to take care of sheltering you? That God's going to provide for you? That he is Jehovah Jireh? And for us to be so wrapped up with anxiety and to worry is to waste our time and the time that God wants to use to redeem in our life. And Jesus is speaking. He says, look at the birds of the air. All right? Just look at the birds of the air. Now, some of you I know in the church are your bird watchers. All right? It's fascinating. We, we in Belize the last two years, we've done our, our retreat in a, in a bird sanctuary where the pastors meet together, and there's a hotel in this bird sanctuary. And it's fascinating to see the animals that are there. Uh, but there's not a one of them. I, I, I sat there and watched these two birds talking one day. I had to figure what else would they be doing? You know, they're just chirping back and forth. But I, I couldn't understand a word they were saying. But I'm sure one of them would say, oh, man, you figured out what you're going to do tomorrow? <laughs> now, we've been eating out of this big pond over here. But man, what if that thing dries up tomorrow? And the other bird put his little wings behind his back. Man, oh man. And scratching, worrying, shaking his hands, you know. None of that was going on. Jesus said, the birds of the air, they don't worry. And your father feeds them. I think the deal is here. You're going to be fed by the father. But why are you wasting your time worrying about it? God's going to make sure you have what you need. You don't have to worry about it. The birds aren't worried. You know, the birds aren't struggling over this. God's taking care of the birds. Their needs are being met. So why, why are you fearful about this? They don't, they, don't, they don't go out and plant fields, but yet they have plenty to eat. They don't go out and harvest the fields. They don't put it in barns. They're not worried about tomorrow's food. The Lord has provided abundantly. And if you, it doesn't take a lot to see. If, if you ever sit around and watch how the birds operate, they're, 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 they're ridiculously energetic. All right? It's probably because they're not wasting all their time worrying about stuff. And they forage for their food. I mean, they're, they're consistently active. But, and the basic thrust is here, you know, yes, we're, we're pursuing life. We're not pursuing stuff. We're pursuing God. In, in the daily course, yes, there's work to be done. God's blessed us so that we can work. There's things to be done and concerns of our life. But we don't let the concerns of our life turn into worries about our life. We trust the Lord. In fact, he uses three areas he talks about. It. He says, you know, why are you worried about food? Look at the birds. God is taking care of them. And you're not, I mean, the birds are nice, but you're worth more to God than birds. I know some of you animal lovers think that that's on the same level, but not so. He says it here. All right? God, you're worth more to God than birds. That's why God let you eat birds, all right? <laughs> I love animals, one guy said, no matter how you cook them. But anyway... <laughs> You're worth more than the birds are. He said, the birds aren't worried. Yes, they're foraging. They're doing what they're called, but they're not gathering stuff into barns. Your father feeds them. Job says he prepares for the raven its nourishment when his children cry out to God in Job 38. Hey, and the ravens, by the way, are an unclean animal to God. God said, I'll take care of the ravens too. So he said, you have to trust the Lord. In fact, Birds, birds are foraging all the time. They're taking care of their, their, their family, their, their nest, their, their young ones are, are foraging for each other and feeding each other. They're taking care of business, but they're not worrying. They're not, they're not stressed out by the activity. In fact, the only time birds get overweight is when they're in captivity. 
There's a sermon there. I think I'll leave it alone. <laughs> we get in bondage. Amen? We worry, obviously, and that certainly brings the greatest captivity of anything. But the birds aren't stockpiling anything just for the sake of saying, I've got it. You know, we have people stockpiling, I'm gloating over it and how much I've got and how much you don't got and living with pride in their life. Hey, the birds are taken care of. And I think the implication is God didn't create the birds in his image. He created you in his image. Birds aren't sinners. Men are sinners. Jesus died for men. Jesus has promised to those who come to him joint heirship with him in the family of God. He has made covenant promises to you as a human being that you can participate in his family. God cares about you. Does, has that escaped us again? We just hear it all the time. God loves you. God loves you. Uh, somewhere, you know, we just stop and realize the truth of that. God does love me. We had communion last week. We were talking about the, uh, the value of Jesus' sacrifice. But realize it was done for you, for God so loved the world. And I'm in the world, and God loves me. All right? Now, the issue is sometimes, I, I'm probably harder on myself sometimes than God is. Probably most of the time, I, I look down on myself more than I probably ought to. All right? I condemn myself probably more than I ought to. But God doesn't. No condemnation. And if I fail, come to the cross. We confess your sins. God forgives your sins. He's faithful and just to his promises. That's part of the whole lesson of contentment. Of course, the idea is that when I'm confessing my sins, I'm so sick of that, I don't want to go back to him again. I find there's greater peace and contentment in just loving Jesus today, following Christ and serving my king and honoring the Lord with my life. It's either that or we get back to trying to take everything out of his hands and control it ourselves. Listen, but no bird has a place in heaven that the Lord is building for them. You've been promised that. No bird is an heir, joint heir with Jesus. All of us now, we're family of God. We're children of God because we put our faith in him. The idea that somehow that God's not going to feed us, that needs to, that needs to get out of your mind. God's going to take care of you. I know that as we get older in our life, then we start thinking about, oh, man, did I set aside this, and I've taken care of this, and have I done this. Listen, God's going to take care of you. I don't know how. I don't know by what means, by what measure, but he's going to take care of you. You can trust him, but it comes back to this idea, I'm going to trust him. I'm not going to trust the world. So we worry about food. Don't worry about food. Some of the last things some of you guys all worry about, me included. I could do without a few meals, by the way. Don't say amen, sister. <laughs> worry about longevity she said you can add one cubit to your life one no you're not gonna be able to add one day of your life by worrying about it now this is obviously a culture that's obsessed with this mindset of longevity i mean y'all seen the tv commercials and the ads add years to your life you know take these human growth hormones add more years to your life be young again all this stuff and we're just in and day you can go to any health care store and it's just aisle after aisle of supplements to supplement you so that you can be supplemented with extra days of living. More life, more vigor, more vitality. Live life. Yeah, the guy's living the life when you're paying to buy all the pills from. <laughs> There's one thing to take care of yourself. It's just silly to, to think that you're going to add days to your life. I think you can add, you can make your days better by taking care of yourself, obviously by exercise, eating the right things, and taking care, right? You can make your days better, but I don't, think, I don't think anybody in here can make their days longer. I only know of one biblical example of a Hezekiah when he prayed, give him 15 more years, and the Lord gave him that, all right? But the Bible says that there, God, God has put borders around all of us about the days that we'll live. You know, it's like it's, it's numbered. David said, Lord, help us to number our days. In other words, God's calendar, God, help me to realize that there's going to come a day, could be today, could be tomorrow. When it's over, there's a limitation to my lifespan. I don't know what it is. God knows what it is. My responsibility is not to worry about it, though. And why should I worry about it? Because what's after the lifespan is far better than what the lifespan's made of. The eternal life, Paul, the Paul said, I can't even compare the things of this life with the next life to come. So what are you worried about? Well, what if I die? graduation day amen what if i die that, that's so stupid when we think about what the bible promises that's such a waste 
Well, who's going to take care of mama? God. <laughs> who's going to take care of son? God. You think he doesn't love them as much as he loves you? And so we worry. He says you can't add a day to your life by worrying, but the gift of life comes from God. It's to be used for his purposes, but God's going to take care of you while you live this life. Our concern should just be to honor the Lord with what he's given us and please him with the time that he's given us. Then we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about it. So what's the third thing? He says, well, you worry about your clothing. I spoke of this a little bit already. Jesus said, why are you concerned about what you're going to wear? Observe the lilies of the field. Lilies are beautiful. He said, I tell you that Solomon, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, a couple things from that. Obviously, I guess Solomon was quite the dresser. You know, pretty stunning, stylish. He had all the money to do so with it. Every fabric from every corner of the world came through that part of the world. I mean, so he had the latest and the greatest of all the fashion. I think that's pretty much what it's saying here. You know, Solomon, Solomon knew how to dress up. I don't know where he shopped, <laughs> but he shopped, and he got what he needed, and he had the people who made it at hand, ready to go, personal tailors. And Jesus said, that's pretty glorious looking. I mean, Jesus come, you know, like that. Solomon looked pretty glorious. But it does not compare to one lily's beauty in the field. Clothes the way, drapes the way. I mean, flowers are stunning when you take the time to look at flowers. They're stunningly beautiful. They're just magnificent if you really take time. They're just magnificent. God says, don't you think I care more about you than flowers? That flower looks so pretty today. It's going to be dead tomorrow. The thing about flowers, they don't last long, right? It's pretty much here today, gone tomorrow. See, the only thing they're good for after that is you just mend together that and the, and the dry grass. Grass may look beautiful when it's cut and beautiful out there growing, but when it dries up and dies, the grass and the flowers are not good for anything to be put into the furnace. What does that mean? Well, that's the way they would fuel their baking ovens with the, with the dead flowers and the dead grass. That'd be part of the cooking process and getting the, flower, the fire started and implementing, you know, the, the kindling, so to say. In other words, all that beauty, one little thing, it's all in that bag. God did that. But listen, God, God concern, is far more concerned about you than how, how those flowers look. Okay? God, God, God will take care of you. Do you think God's going to deal with your life and take care of your life? But yet we live in this culture that just still, we just lust after clothing and style and, and fashion and spend vast amounts of money on clothes that might be worn a few times even for one occasion, a special thing. So you're saying, you're just worried about all the wrong stuff. I'm going to take care of you. I tell you, we're living in a time when people just made a God out of fashion. All right? But God says, along with the grass, along with the flowers, along with the birds, I got you covered. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch after you. How much more is God concerned to clothe you and to care for you and to feed you and to take care of your life? And to be anxious about these things, Jesus is simply saying, to be anxious about these things is to show, he says, open it this way, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. Many times, I, I'll be honest with you, folks, there's times in the evening, I'll lie down on my bed and a million things come into my mind. And the mind starts racing. How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with that problem? How are you going to resolve that situation? How are you going to take care of that? And what if this happens? That's one of Satan's favorite. What about? What, you know, it could happen. Then what are you going to do? I'll tell you what. I'm going to think about what I will do when it does happen. Until then... I'm not going to sweat the small stuff, all right? I'm not going to worry about those things because there's a natural tendency of our, in our humanity to make those things, the very things that our mind, our attention goes to, and it literally just saps us of all our life. In fact, it was, it was Dr. Charles Mayo, the famous Mayo Clinic, who made this statement. Worry affects the circulation of your heart and your glands and your whole nervous system. He said, I've never met a man who died of overwork but I've known a lot of people who died from worry. I think that's, Jesus is making it pretty clear there himself. Why are, you, why are you lusting after these particular things? 
Why, why, are you, why are you concerned about those things? Listen, I believe we, we break it down like this, that worry, if you're hearing what Jesus has to say, is not a trivial sin. In fact, there's four other times that Jesus speaks about worry, and he's not talking about it in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. It's not just a repeat of that scenario. There's once in Luke where he's talking about worry and not to worry, and there's three more times in Matthew in three different occasions, counting the fourth being the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, don't worry. Luke 12, I mean, in Matthew 12 and 16, I think 18, he says, don't worry. Stop worrying, and don't worry anymore about it. Stop worrying. Don't worry anymore about it. You're wasting your time worrying about it. Worry about it. I'll close with this passage from Ephesians. Where Paul's writing to the church, and I think this should be the prayer of all of our lives, where he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. Those are in accordance with the working and the strength of his might. What's he saying? I'm praying that God would open your mind and open your eyes to really understand that God owns it all, God controls it all, and God can give it all to you, what you need. That's pretty much wraps up what he's saying there. I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding would be open. I know I've shared this illustration years ago in a sermon when I was talking about finances. Back when I was in evangelism, the Lord was teaching us a lot of lessons, Kathy and I, in those early days of ministry, how to trust him. And that what it really meant to really believe the Lord in a real actual daily basis, not say, I believe Jesus, I'm going to heaven. For his life. That's saving faith. That's wonderful. I'm talking about living faith. The Bible says we're saved by faith, but it all goes, also, also goes on to say the just shall live by faith, right? So I'm not only saved by faith, I'm called to a faith life and a faith walk. And we were involved in ministry, and um, each week was a challenge. Each week was unique. Uh, but we saw God meet us on every turn. There would be things that we would be desiring to do. We believe it was the Lord to do. Uh, and God would just provide the money. Just, it would be there. And God still does that, by the way. It's still a faith life, and it's still a faith walk with Him. But we came in from one of our road trips we'd been on, been on the road about three weeks and doing revivals and crusades across southwestern United States. We drove our bus back in. We had a motor home that was made of an old Greyhound bus. And I parked at our ministry headquarters, and we went to the house and got in the car and went to the house and we're started going through all the mail. Had family members go by and get our mail every day, and they, they brought it to the house and stack a mail like this for three or four weeks, and we're sorting through these bills. And, of course, I'm over here. Kathy's counting the, how much we owe on the bills, and I'm looking at, you know, the checks that we've received from the churches and the people that have been sending us some gifts. And uh, there was this trend going on for the last several weeks that there was a lot more bills coming in than there was money. Anybody ever have those in their life? You know, and um, I was deeply concerned <laughs> and worried. And uh, I'm thinking, Lord, you know, I know your promises. And there's nothing here that's frivolous. It's just gas bills, light bills, you know, necessities of life that we have in the, in the world that we're living in. And it wasn't, you know, like uh, there's a credit card bill from Macy's for all the extravagant clothing I was wearing. <laughs> there was nothing like that. And I, I told Kathy, I said, you know, I said, uh, I'm going to run away. I'm getting out of here. I said, I, I got to hear from God. She said, what do you mean? I'm going to run away too. I said, no, I really need to get along with the Lord. I said, uh, I'm just going to get in the bus. I'm going to drive it down to Galveston or Crystal Beach somewhere. I said, and I'm just going to fast and pray until God gives me a word. And I'm not going to break the fast until I get a word from God. And... Uh, Day one went by, spent a lot of time praying. In fact, I just parked the bus because it's pretty much self-contained right on the beach in, in Crystal Beach. And um, spent some time with the Lord, a lot of time praying, a lot of time reading Scripture. Second day goes by, nothing from the Lord. Third day, praise God, I was starving. <laughs> Lord came through that afternoon, just gave me a real clear word. It all kind of went around while I just quoted the just shall live by faith. And, and the Lord just kind of spoke to my heart about, you know, I've been doing all these things according to his will and his purpose in my life, but where was I really trusting him in real active, obvious ways in my life to meet these needs, specifically? Now, we've been doing some things we already knew to do, and one of the things we early learned on early in our ministry, especially if we're going to keep the flow coming, then we had to keep the outflow going. 
You give and you get. So you can give some more, so you can get some more, so you can give some more, so you can get some more. There's that principle of giving and harvesting and reaping, you know, the seed sown. But it would just become rote. It just become what we did. It was just an action that was going on in our life without any real faith. You, you understand what I'm saying? And I've, I've weighed this out with an evangelist friend of mine that we've mentioned before, and, uh, Manly Beasley, and I said, you know, I'd always heard Manly that where God guides, he provides. And another cute saying was, where God leads, he feeds. Another, he said, well, those are cute sayings, but they're not accurate. I said, that's kind of the message the Lord gave me in my heart in this time. He said, the truth of the matter is, God provides what you're believing him for. What are you trusting God for? Where's faith in your life? It's an action that goes on. It's, 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 it's the way we live our life. It's like breathing. I'm trusting. I'm putting my faith in the Lord. I'm not going to worry about this. Worry, anxiety, stress, fear, those are all signs that we're not trusting, right? You, you understand that? Yes. This means yes, okay, that I'm not trusting the Lord. So I'd ask you today, whatever it is that you are really worrying about, where, where is trust in all that? Where, where, how are you moving that? How are you going to negotiate that in your life and bring that from the place where I'm, I'm going to really bring it to the altar and we're going to make this a matter of prayer now and a matter of commitment and I'm not going to stress about it. God, come through. We're going to come through. I'm going to come through. I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry, you know? I'm going to begin to pray. I'm not saying, pr some people think prayer is worrying on their knees. All right, that's not prayer. That's not prayer. And one of the greatest lessons that we learned in that moment of our time was, I need to believe God. It's an action in my life. I'm believing God to meet my needs. I'm believing God to supply this. I have a, I have a crisis in your home. I'm believing God to meet that crisis. I'm concerned about it, but I'm not going to turn, let it turn to fear, and I'm not going to let it turn to doubt, and I'm not going to let it turn to worry, because I'm going to storm the gates of heaven with this thing. And I'm going to hold on like that little widow till she gets her final answer and approval from God. God, give me a word. God, give me an answer. God, meet my need. I'm going to knock and keep on knocking. I'm going to seek and keep on seeking. But I'm not going to give way to the bondage of worry in my life. And that was such an important lesson. And I really don't believe that we would be where we are even in the church if God hadn't taught us those lessons early. You know? Well, I remember one guy after we started the church, I don't guess you have to worry about a paycheck anymore. I said, no, I've got to worry about 300 people's paycheck so they can give to the church. <laughs> don't worry anymore, though. It's the same thing. We keep giving, but we keep trusting. Yes. And we keep honoring the Lord with what he's given us, with our time, with our talents, with our treasures. And we're realizing that everything we do is unto him and for his glory. And he takes care of the rest because he owns it all. Amen. He controls it all. Yes. And he is Jehovah Jireh. Yes. He'll give us what we need. Mm -hmm. And we can trust him for that. That's how you got saved, isn't it? You realized you had a need, and you needed a Savior, and you couldn't save yourself, and you came to Jesus. It's how you live your life. We walk by faith, not by sight. We lean on the Word, not on our emotions, not on our circumstances, because that changes radically, incredibly fast. Amen? Every one of you, and many of you already have, are going to face some very crisis moments in your life. You'll let those things strangle you, drain every other thing out of your mind, because that's all you can focus on, or you'll learn to submit those things to the Lord. And the best time to do it is not when the crisis comes and the insurmountable mountains of issues rise in your life. Now's the time, while you're in the valley, or maybe while you're making your way through the molehills. <laughs> the molehills become the training for believing God in the mountains but you'll see God move. You hold on to him, you believe him, he is faithful. Amen. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul, even when I'm unfaithful, he's been faithful. Yes. Let's stand with our heads bowed. I'd encourage you today just to take heart with this message and that your prayer would be the same as the Apostles for the Ephesian Church. Remember, he's talking to believers and he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. So you can see all that God is, all that God's done, all that God can and will do in your life. That you're a child of God. And that you can grow and your life can blossom spiritually. But as long as you're so preoccupied with the world or the flesh and situations, you're going to miss God's grace and glory. This morning, those who will be here in this altar are here to pray with you. If you want to come to this altar this morning and just find a place by yourself between you and your high priest Jesus, you come and pray.
If you're here without Jesus, please come to any one of these men that are standing here. Listen, and just to be honest, say, I need to give my life to Christ. Let us walk you through that process of surrender. But that's really what it is, is turning your back on yourself and running to the Savior, choosing to follow Him. Make that decision today. Let us rejoice with you. Let us pray for you, pray over you in that regard. God, meet that need of your life. That's the greatest need you'll ever face. Maybe there's some of the situation you just want someone to pray with you about, to pray for you. Or maybe there's a sickness you want somebody to anoint you with oil. You come today. We're a church that believes in the power of prayer. Let God do a work in your life today as we worship the Lord. You come in Jesus' name. Don't wait for anyone else.